Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shereen Ash. I'm very happy to um, welcome you today to a wonderful talk with naturalist Shannon Burke. As you see, we're discussing, and as you all know, we're going to be learning about backyard birds. Shannon Burke, um, as many of you know, works for the Marin County Parks. She's an interpretive naturalist and a favorite hike leader, knowing so much about the local flora and fauna. So um, we have you captive here for an hour while Shannon uh, leads the conversation. Please stay muted throughout. There'll be time for questions at the end. Please put any questions you might have in the chat and I will read them out um, and Shannon will answer them as we have time. Just to note that this recording, this program is being recorded and barring any technical difficulties will be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel within two weeks. So with that, I will disappear and reappear for the question and answer period. And Shannon, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Shireen. Um, it is always so fun to, to partner with um, Shireen and the Corte Madera Library to do lectures like this. Um, so hello, everyone. I am Shannon Burke. I'm the interpretive naturalist with Marin County Parks. And today we're going to talk about backyard birds. Um, why isn't my slide? There we go. Um, so Marin County Parks uh, manages 34 different preserves and then also um, some parks and we're kind of scattered around the county, lots of different habitats that you can enjoy um, with lots of birds in different places. And we offer programs like this. And then I also do uh, naturalist walks. I typically do one or two a week. And then we also have um, fabulous ranger programming and volunteer programming. So if you want to learn more, you can check out our website, marincountyparks.org. Um, so here in Marin, we have a lot of different types of neighborhoods, um, which means we have a lot of different habitats. So for instance, some people might live near an open space, or you might live kind of in a city street. Um, you might live near a park. You might be in an apartment building and just have a deck or something like that. But all of these can offer um, ways to observe birds, to hear them, to see them, to kind of see what they're doing. So we're going to go through some of our common feathered neighbors and um, basically just kind of give a little, a little overview of um, kind of more like tidbits of each species and, and what to watch out for. So we'll start with morning doves. This is a, a really common urban bird. Um, and these birds breed pretty much almost all year round. And so they have multiple broods or clutches, a, a, a batch of eggs, like one nest um, is called a brood or a clutch. And so these birds are capable of breeding kind of throughout the year. And so you might have for instance, a pair that um, has a nest of young and it, it can be only just like a month after they have started that nest that they start another one. And in some cases, the young are actually, they're still tending their young from the first batch. So um, we end up with a lot of morning dove breeding activity. And um, thing is, they don't build much of a nest. Um, and maybe, I don't know, if you're, if you're having that many young, you don't bother with a nest building, but not really. But anyway, um, so a lot of times it can just be a couple little sticks thrown together. And a lot of times they're around our houses. And so these, these birds can be easy to observe. And of course, they have that um, kind of classic, deep, uh, sort of mournful call that you hear. It sounds a little bit like uh, an owl. A lot of people think it sounds like an owl, but they typically are vocalizing during the day where owls like great horn owls are vocalizing at night. Um, another sound that you might hear is when they fly, they have what's called a whistling flight. And so it's actually air moving through their feathers. And it's, it's uh, when they first take off, you can hear it really well. And so it's thought that that might be sort of an alert. And so if uh, something poses a threat and they suddenly take off, that sound can alert other morning doves in the area that might be related to them to that potential threat. One thing to notice on these birds when they fly is that they've got this pointed tail. So their, their feathers come down in a point like this. And recently, um, since about 2006, Eurasian colored doves have showed up in Marin. And um, 
One thing to note is that they have a rounded tail instead of that pointed tail. And these birds um, also have this collar around the back of their neck. And so that's different from the morning doves. So you can easily distinguish between these two species. And these birds aren't native to the US. Um, so they were actually brought in. There was um, a pet store in the Bahamas in the 70s that had these. And there was a robbery, supposedly. And during that robbery, birds got let loose and Eurasian collared doves got out. And apparently they made their way to Florida. Um, and then also there was uh, another pet store in uh, the Isle of Guadalupe that uh, a fire was, was threatening to burn down the pet store. And so that pet shop owner released them. Um, and then subsequently after the fire released the rest of them. So it's thought that the birds in the US basically originated from, from those two incidents. And so they moved up into Florida and then spread across the US. Um, and so another uh, local bird that you can see in our neighborhoods are mockingbirds. And um, you might hear these even if you're not seeing them, uh, but they prefer sort of short grassland areas and they like shrubs that have fruit. So they eat a lot of insects, which they can get from grasslands. And then they also like fruit, which they can get from shrubs and trees and things like that. So you can find them um, in areas where things have been grazed by cattle, you know, and so the grass is fairly short. Or you can find them in neighborhoods, like in people's uh, yards where they've got lawns and ornamental shrubs or in city parks, things like that. So their diet is about 50% insects, 50 fruit. Um, and so they can take advantage of uh, plants that are that are growing in yards. And they also can take advantage of things like hedges and shrubs uh, because these are great densely foliated uh, little spots where they can hide their nest. And mockingbirds are called mockingbirds because they mimic the sounds of other birds. So mockingbirds do have their own sounds that they incorporate into their songs, but about 50% of the, the, the songs or the phrases that they have are mimicked from other species. And both the males and the females sing. Uh, the females tend to sing a little bit more quietly and typically not during the breeding season. They sing more in the fall and it might be that they are singing when they set up winter territories. And then males um, might actually have two different sets of songs. So he, he might have one repertoire during the spring that he uses and then another set of songs that he sings more commonly during the fall. But these birds can have thousands of different, or sorry, not thousands, hundreds of different songs in their repertoire. Um, and sometimes you'll hear one that's singing all through the night. Typically that's an unmated male. And then once, once he uh, finds a mate, he will usually quiet down a little bit. So uh, another really common bird in neighborhoods are American robins. And uh, I think everybody has heard the phrase, the early bird gets the worm. So interestingly, um, Robins actually, they also have a varied diet and they typically eat more worms like earthworms in the morning and then more fruits in the evenings. So they also like areas where you have grasses and then you have ornamental shrubs that have berries. And in neighborhoods, you get a lot of um, berry eating birds attracted to places that have pyracanthas or cotoneaster, which are two common landscape shrubs that have these fruits. Um, and so they can take advantage of that. And especially in the winter time, you can end up with big flocks. And so they're rather than being migratory, they're kind of more nomadic. And so they move around looking for food. And then you can have huge roosts of them where you get hundreds of birds in the evening. And then we also have hermit thrushes and they also love berries. And if you're thinking about landscaping your yard, you might think about using some native berries like blue elderberries or red elderberries or toyon. Um, and so our native birds will readily come in and eat the berries from those. And so hermit thrushes are fairly common in neighborhood areas. Um, and unless you live in a sort of shaded deep forest, um, you probably don't get hermit thrushes in your area, um, in your yard or in your neighborhood, except for in the winter time. So they breed in deep forests, a lot of times in coniferous forests, but during the winter, they're really widespread. And so they show up in a lot of backyards and they have really strong site fidelity, um, meaning that they'll come back to the same place year after year. And, um, 
at one place where I lived, I had a hermit thrush return, the same exact hermit thrush, return to my yard every winter for three or four years. And I knew it was the same individual, or at least I assume it was, because it had a malformation of its bill where it was elongated and crossed over. And so not only was that bird still able to eat, but it survived for several years and it made these long migrations. Um, and so our breeding birds, our breeding hermit thrushes move south in the winter time. And then we get hermit thrushes from other places that come here and spend the winter. And then another berry eater that you can find in your neighborhoods are cedar waxwings. And these are gorgeous birds. And here they're on Toyon, so another native um, shrub that produces berries. And the name waxwing comes from the fact that, well, overall, they kind of have this waxy look to them. But if you look at where this white arrow is pointing, um, there are these little red appendages on their secondaries, on the, the shorter wings, on their, or the shorter feathers on their wings. And these are actually waxy secretions. And older birds tend to have these larger red tips and more of them. And the older, the birds with the more, more red tips and the larger red tips end up breeding earlier and having more offspring. And so it seems that what's going on is as they age, they, these red tips grow and um, that older birds are sort of choosing other, other birds that are of a similar age. And it sort of ends up acting like a kind of a social status symbol. And it helps them to recognize uh, the age of other birds. And so they end up mating with those birds first. So another really common neighborhood bird are uh, hummingbirds. And Anna's hummingbirds are here all year round. We're looking at a female here who just has a little bit of a red throat patch but Anna's hummingbirds were originally only found down in Northern Baja California and in Southern California. But as people started planting gardens and all of these ornamental plants that had these great flowers that they could take advantage of the nectar, their range has expanded. Um, so they've moved up northward and now they are year round residents in our, in our gardens, gardens and in our wild places. And so the males have this really bright red kind of purpley gorget that structural color. And so when the light hits it right, it, it, it's like a thousand little prisms that reflect that light. Um, and so the males don't really have anything to do with raising the young. They just sort of, they choose an open area where they can do courtship displays. The females come in, they mate, and then the females uh, find their own territory and they end up building the nest by themselves and raising uh, their young by themselves. So Alan's hummingbirds are another uh, Bird that we have here during the breeding season, but these are really early migrants. So they can start showing up as early as January. And this is a male, really great color. It's got this wonderful orangey color. Um, and the males tend to uh, have, have territories in coastal scrub and in chaparral, places like that. And then the females are a lot more drab, but she still has a little bit of an orangey color. And so the females will go to those areas to breed, and then they will end up finding places that are more forested or like a thicket area and building her nest in spots like that. So obviously hummingbirds will visit hummingbird feeders, uh, but so will orioles. So orioles can also be a really common backyard bird. And so this is a hooded oriole and it's got this dark um, face and then it's got this bright orangey yellow hood on its, on its head. So um, notice that the adult male has um, more of a bright orange color and it's got a, a little bit more white on the wings than um, a young male. So this is in its first summer. So they're more yellow with a little bit less white in the wing. And then the females overall are more drab. So they're just kind of a yellow color, but they also have expanded their ranges. Um, and so in part that might be because of nectar and fruit that's available, but also just where they can build their nests. And so they historically um, were down in Southern California and they took advantage of cottonwoods and willows and palms in the desert and things like that, and especially sycamore trees. And um, as people planted palm trees all up the coast, they expanded their range. And so they really take advantage of fan palms um, where the leaves are kind of this shape. And what they do is they, they uh, take off the little sort of fibrous 
threads that are on the edges of the leaves, and then they weave nests out of that. And they actually, the female will poke holes into the leaves and then suspend the nest from underneath the leaf. So because a lot of neighborhoods have palm trees, that's a great place to look for the Orioles. And then as I mentioned, they also readily visit hummingbird feeders. Um, they have an enzyme called sucrase, which helps to digest sucrose, which is what's in hummingbird feeders. And not many birds have that ability. Um, hummingbirds do, Orioles do, uh, things like warblers. And so they're able to actually digest um, to, to really get the nutrients out of those sugars. And a lot of other birds just don't have enough of the sucrase. Anyway, so this can be an adapted advantage for birds that are migrating down south in the, in the winter time to take advantage of food sources that have a lot of sugar down there. They'll also readily come to things like orange slices. So you can put orange slices out in your backyard and you might be able to attract these birds. And then house finches are called house finches because a lot of times they will nest um, you know, in the gutters or on an eave or something of a house. So they can be really closely associated with human habitations. And um, they also readily come to a different type of feeder. So you can have nectar feeders and you can have seed feeders. Um, and it can be an opportunity to see these house finches. So the males are bright red and the females are just brown and streaky. And that red in the males comes from their diet, from carotenoids, which are a, a pigment in, their, in the foods that they're eating. And if they don't get enough of the right pigment, um, they can end up being sort of orange or yellow. And it turns out that the females preferentially choose males that are a brighter red color. Yeah, oh, and I should say that um, house finches are native to this area. They are originally in the Western US and um, down in part of, parts of Mexico but they are now across all of the US. And the reason for that is that there was a pet shop in, um, in Long Island that tried to sell them as Hollywood finches. And I, if I remember correctly, I think this was in the forties. Um, anyway, and they, they weren't that successful. And so the pet shop owner ended up releasing them. And just from a few birds, they ended up multiplying and then spreading throughout the, the whole rest of the US and up into Southern Canada. All right, so um, we also have American goldfinches that really like seeds. So finches in general like seeds. So that's why you can see them at seed feeders. But also if you have uh, plants in your neighborhood that produce seeds, the, all of the finches will definitely take advantage of that. So American goldfinches during the breeding season are really bright yellow. Uh, the male has this nice dark cap. So the male is on the left, the lower bird. And then the females don't have a dark cap, but fairly bright yellow. And during the breeding season, they have kind of a pinkish bill. Um, in the non-breeding season, they look very different. So they go through this really dramatic change and they turn this kind of almost like peachy buff color and their bills turn gray. And these guys breed in um, typically more kind of humid, coastal, foggy areas, whereas the lesser goldfinches typically breed in drier, warmer areas, but they kind of need a permanent source of water. So uh, bird browse can be a good way to attract a lot of birds, including gold, goldfinches like this. Um, and the lesser goldfinches are smaller, but size can be difficult to gauge unless it's right next to an American goldfinch. But also they, their back is darker. So they kind of down the, the back of their neck and onto their back, they have a dark olive green color. And if you have things like feeders in your yard, you might actually also get um, other birds that are taking advantage of that, like Cooper's hawks. So exhibitors are um, small hawks like this, the Cooper's hawks and the Sharpshin hawks. Um, and Cooper's hawks are fairly common in neighborhoods, even during the breeding season, where Sharpshin hawks are, are, we get most of them here in the winter time. So, um, but they're kind of ambush hunters and they hunt birds in, in forested areas through trees and stuff like that. And so they, they can kind of hide in the shadows and then they will quickly come out and swoop, you know, toward um, the birds that might be in your backyard, might be in a feeder or something like that. Um, and a lot of people think that this is a really terrible thing. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that like everybody's got to eat. Right. And so these birds are also feeding their young. And then American crows um, really are, are sort of um, 
blamed for a lot of nest predation that isn't necessarily caused by them. So they will take eggs and they will take nestlings from um, nests, but studies have been done where they set up cameras at nests and, and look to sort of find out who was predating them. And the highest number was from da -da -da -dum, Western squirrels and other squirrels, so squirrels and also snakes. Um, and then you had mammals like raccoons and opossums and then uh, raptors and scrub jays and even cowbirds that are parasitic birds that lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. Um, and then they leave them to raise their young for them basically. But in that process, they'll actually swap out eggs fairly frequently. So the female will lay an egg in that nest. So let's say she lays an, an egg in the nest of a uh, warbling vireo or something, right? She might remove one of those eggs and eat it. And so that there's still the same number of eggs when the female returns to that nest, when the female of the other species. Um, and then even mice will predate uh, bird, bird nests. So crows come kind of down below all of those things. So uh, just to just to kind of say like they get they get an unfair, um, they're unfairly blamed for the majority of predation. Anyway, but um, you can get huge flocks of these guys. And so they have family groups. And then in the wintertime, those family groups join and create these big flocks where they roost at night. And then they also um, will try to forage for food together. And so a lot of people have noticed an increase in crows around urban areas. And there are a few reasons. They're very smart birds. And so they can take advantage of food waste that we're leaving out, garbage or pet food or fallen fruit from trees, things like that. Um, they have a really wide ranging diet. And so they can take advantage of a lot of different things that humans are providing in those habitats. Another thing is that um, where you have humans, you have more light at night. And that can actually cut down on, on great horned owls predating the nests of crows. So great horned owls are kind of their biggest predator. Um, and so if you've got light, it kind of keeps the owls away. Also, the, the crows may be able to see an owl coming. And then another thing is where you have buildings and you have pavement, um, streets, sidewalks, all of these things, during the day, those surfaces are absorbing heat. And then at night, that's reflected. And so it's, it can actually be warmer in urban areas. And, and that can be beneficial for the crows as well in the wintertime. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so crows are becoming more common in urban areas, but um, ravens are as well, not quite as common, but ravens in the, in previously they, they were more in wildland areas, kind of remote areas away from humans, but they have also become more adapted to humans. So to tell the difference, one thing to look for if, if they're um, standing is you can look at their bill, the ravens really have this massive bill um, and the crow's bill is big, but it's it's shorter and it's just kind of a little bit more triangular. The raven, the raven bill is a little bit more rounded on the top. And then ravens also have really shaggy feathers around their head and their neck. So those can be good things to look for. And they're, they're bigger, but again, sometimes size can be difficult to tell. And then in flight, crows typically have a rounded tail, whereas ravens have sort of a spade shaped tail. So it kind of comes to a point like V. And so that can be a good thing to look for when they're flying. And then um, jays are related to crows. So they're all corvids and these are highly intelligent birds. And one thing that that means is that um, they're able to take advantage of a lot of different food sources. And so just like uh, crows and ravens, scrub jays also take advantage of different food sources. Um, and they really take advantage of acorns. And so if you live in a neighborhood that has oak trees in the fall, you can see these guys uh, finding acorns and flying with them in their mouths and then caching them, hiding them somewhere. And so an individual scrub jay can collect up to like 5,000 acorns during the fall and will hide each of those either, you know, in a crevice in the bark or, or down on the ground in the soil, something like that. And their, their memories are amazing. Um, they can, they basically build a, a mental map as they're hiding all of these acorns and they can go back and remember where they're stashed and retrieve them up to like eight months later. Um, and so during the fall, they're taking advantage of this abundant food source 
that they can rely on for months and months and months after that food source, you know, becomes so abundant. Anyway, so um, they can be responsible for the, the dispersal of oak trees, right? So they're, they're not only taking those, those seeds away from the original tree, but they're also burying them. And then some of them will end up germinating and turning into new trees before they can grow. And one thing that's super fun to observe is that squirrels will do this too. And so the jays and the squirrels are both collecting acorns and they're both burying them in the ground. And sometimes uh, you'll find jays kind of trying to fake, each, fake out other jays or fake out squirrels. And so they'll pretend to hide an acorn in a spot, but then they'll actually turn around and it'll still be in their mouth. And then they'll go and hide it in another spot. Um, and lots and lots of birds will take advantage of acorns, including California quail. And so quail can be a common backyard bird. Um, they have these family groups where you have a male that typically stands sentry during the breeding season and will raise the alarm if any potential threat comes. And then the female is usually down on the ground with the chicks and they can have about a dozen young at the beginning of the season. And not all of those make it to um, their teenage years but they end up with these big family groups. And then in the winter time, you, you get multiple family groups coming together. And so you end up with these really big flocks. And they're one of our latest breeders because they eat a lot of seeds. And so a lot of plants like grasses and things aren't developing their seeds until later in the season, like in the summer. Um, so you can have quail breeding a little bit later, taking advantage of all of those seeds. And then uh, another acorn eater is the acorn woodpecker. So if, if your neighborhood has big oak trees in it, um, you might very well hear these guys. They're, they're really raucous. It almost sounds like they're laughing. Um, and they have these trees that are called granary trees. And sometimes they'll even use um, like a wooden power pole or something like that. But what they do is they drill holes and then they stash the acorns and they breed cooperatively. So they um, have, for one nest, they can have multiple adults that are actually breeding and contributing their genes to those eggs. And then they also cooperatively um, raise those young and they are collecting acorns. And so that allows them to stay on territory through the winter time because then they have all of these acorns that they can eat during the winter time. And then in the spring and summer, they actually eat a ton of insects, which is their preferred food. So they love things like flying ants and bees and uh, wasps and things like that. So we have some other uh, neighborhood woodpeckers. One is the Nuttles woodpecker, and these also are associated with mature oaks, but they can be found in sort of like lowland riparian areas that are surrounded by oaks. Um, and one thing to note is that they've got bar, but these white bars all the way across their back. And also note that this one has red on the back of its head. So that means it's a male. The, the females don't have red on the back of their head. So here is a hairy woodpecker that is similar, but if you look at the back, it's got this nice white rectangle. And this is a female. It doesn't have any red on the head. And downy and hairy woodpeckers look almost identical, but downies are sort of miniature versions of the hairies. Um, and so again, these are both males. They've got red on the back of the head and you can't really see their back, but both of these have a big white rectangle on the back of their head. And so these guys make kind of squeaky noises. Um, and then during the breeding season, they don't sing, but they drum. So you can hear a boop, 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 where they're rapidly drumming. And that's the way that they mark their territory and advertise that that they're there. And woodpeckers excavate cavities and typically they will make a new cavity each year to breed in. And what's, what this means is that there are a lot of other birds that um, are cavity nesters that aren't really capable of excavating cavities in the way that woodpeckers are. Woodpeckers have incredibly strong bills. Um, and so they're able to really get in there and, and, and chip away at all of the wood. And so other birds will take advantage of that. Um, like I said, because the woodpeckers typically will make a new cavity each year. So then in subsequent years, you have these abandoned cavities. So things like oak titmice are really common in neighborhoods and they will take advantage of cavities, whether woodpecker cavities or natural cavities where a branch has fallen off a tree or something like that. Um, and so these are really vocal birds. They make a lot of noise. So you might notice them in their yard, in your yard or in the area, just because they are so vocal and they tend to form lifelong 
pairs, they mate for life, and then um, they tend to remain on territory year round, so or year after year. They have these very stable territories, and so I love thinking about the fact that you know if you if you observe titmice uh, last winter, this winter it might be the same birds, or even this spring it might be the same individual birds that you're seeing in your neighborhood. And uh, this is a great photo of one that looks like it's got this outrageous mustache. And they'll also take advantage of fur. So if you have a dog and you brush your dog during the breeding season, take, instead of throwing that fur away or composting it, put it outside. And a lot of different birds will actually take advantage of it and incorporate it in their nests. They'll also fly up into the corners of your windows and collect spider webs. So things like titmice and hummingbirds and a lot of other birds will incorporate spider webs into their nests as well. Um, and chickadees will as well. And they actually, they, so they're cavity nesters as well, and they'll take advantage of woodpecker cavities, um, things like that, but inside they line it with fur. And so there can be about a half inch of animal fur that's in there. And so it could be from a deer or a coyote fur or, you know, rabbit fur, whatever they're finding locally. But like I said, if you've got a dog and you put your dog fur out there, um, they'll take advantage of that. And so they've got this pile of fur and early on when, they are, when the, they've got eggs, if they leave the nest, they'll actually take that fur and cover the eggs um, to help keep them insulated while they're out of the, the cavity. Buick's wrens are also cavity nesters. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, so for instance, a female Buick's wren is, they're known to, if you get too close to the cavity, they will quietly flush. So they'll fly out of the cavity and then they will frequently kind of find another nearby spot and actually scold you. And so it's kind of this harsh scolding noise. And so one thing to keep in mind as you know, you're exploring your neighborhood, your yard, whatever, and looking for birds is if, if it seems like a bird is agitated by you, move away from it and let it go about its business. And if it's more relaxed and if it doesn't feel threatened, you'll actually be able to observe it doing its natural behavior as well. Another cavity nester are Western bluebirds. And these have a really interesting um, sort of social system. They, they very frequently will have adults beyond, um, well, let me start with this. You have a pair of birds and a lot of times they will uh, have more than one clutch or batch of eggs during the breeding season. And so it might be two or three nesting attempts. And so by the end of the breeding season, you can end up with two adults and then all of their young that are still hanging out with them. And they will persist as these family groups. Toward the end of the summer, typically what happens is the daughters from that breeding season will actually leave their own family and they will go find another family and join that group. And then daughters from a different family come and join that original one. So you kind of have the daughters moving around. And so you ultimately, by the winter time, you end up with an adult pair and then their sons from that year, and then sort of their foster daughters from another family. Um, and they can stick together throughout the, the winter time. Um, and then in the following spring, sometimes the, the sons and then the foster daughters will actually uh, breed together. Tree swallows are also cavity nesters. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is with development, we're losing more and more trees that are big, big mature trees that have holes in them that are available for these cavity nesters. And so they can be in short supply. And so these birds can actually, at the beginning of the breeding season, they will really fight over these cavities. And so swallows like tree swallows and violet green swallows might fight with things like chickadees and in some cases even to the death. And so they can get into some pretty serious scraps. Um, so one thing is that they will take advantage, all of these birds that I just talked about that are cavity nesters will take advantage of uh, birdhouses or, or nest boxes. And if, if you have a yard, if you live in an area that seems like it's appropriate for these birds, you could think about putting out a nest box and that will, um, you know, greatly enhance the habitat for them and their opportunity to nest. One thing to keep in mind is if you do something like that, you know, you want to take responsibility for it. And so the birds will be really, really active as long as they have young. And then all of a sudden they will just disappear basically. And so that means that 
usually that the young have fledged. And once they fledge, a lot of times they'll move out of your yard and then they'll be in the surrounding neighborhood looking for food and stuff. And so if you observe that the activity has suddenly stopped and you're no longer seeing birds, that's a really good time to go out and clean the box. So take out all of the old sticks and the nesting material. You can even like give it a good hose down. Um, and if you want a lot of things like bird feeders or bird baths or, or nest boxes, you can rinse with a solution of um, nine parts water and one part bleach or vinegar, and then just like rinse it and then let it dry. And then, um, you know, hopefully the next batch of birds will come and use it. Another bird that is frequently found around houses, but on the sides of houses, are cliff swallows. And so these build mud nests and these are colonial nesters. And so where you have one, you typically have multiples, um, multiple nests. And these nests are built, that each nest is built out of like a thousand different mud pellets that they are bringing to the nest just bit by bit by bit and building on top of it. Um, some people find them messy and they don't want them. If, if you or somebody you know has them attempting to build on the side of your house and you don't want it, um, you know, some people hose them down. I would say if you do that, do it while they're still in the process of building it. The last thing you want is to hose off some nests that already have eggs or, or young inside of them, right? And then barn swallows um, build a similar nest out of mud pellets, but they typically incorporate grasses. And they also, and, and they're usually um, opposed to the cliff swallows, they're solitary rather than colonial. So you'll just get one nest. And, and I should mention that these guys are super fun to watch. So if, if you have swallows nesting on the side of your house, um, it, it can be a great thing to experience, even if it is a little messy. So black phoebes also build a mud nest and uh, they can look a lot like barn swallow nests, but the barn swallows typically put, line the inside of the nest with feathers. And sometimes they'll even add one big feather that can be sticking out. Um, so sometimes that's a way to identify them. So black phoebes are a type of flycatcher. And so a lot of flycatchers have a little crest on their head. Uh, black phoebes look like they're wearing a little tuxedo and they do what's called tail pumping. Um, and so it kind of uh, bounces its tail up and down. And a study was done on these birds, which suggested that they're increasing the number of tail pumps in reaction to predators. So for instance, um, when Cooper's hawks were observed by these birds, their tail pumping, kind of the, the up and down wagging of their tail, um, tripled. And so the thought is that they're signaling to predators that, they're, that they see them and that they're not, uh, it's not worth trying to catch them because they, they're onto them. They know that they're there. So another uh, dark hooded bird are Oregon juncos. This is a type of sparrow. These are really common in neighborhoods. And they can form really big flocks. And so you get these big social flocks, especially in the winter time where they're chattering away. Inside of those flocks, they have hierarchies though and, and sort of uh, this, this social structure within those big flocks. And then another dark hooded sparrow is the spotted towhee. So these are a really large sparrow. Um, and they've got these gorgeous red eyes and they spend a lot of time on the ground but during the breeding season, they'll get up on shrubs and things like that and uh, vocalize. And they have a really metallic sort of trill, which is their song. And this is one of the earliest birds to sing in the morning. So um, there's some evidence that larger songbirds like robins and towhees um, and uh, California towhees um, are these large birds and they have large eyes and that they're actually able to detect the coming light. So before a lot of smaller birds are, so they can be some of the earliest birds to sing. So uh, California towhees have sort of a bouncing ball sound and pre-dawn they'll go around and sort of on the perimeters of their territory, fly from one spot to another and they'll do this vocalization. And um, so I know that uh, many years in my neighborhood where I've lived, uh, this is one of the first birds I hear while it's still dark outside. And then typically, if you hear one singing during the day, it's typically an unmated male. So they usually quiet down once, once they've mated. So in the winter time, you can get big groups of white crowned sparrows and um, these nest in run, but only kind of around the bay and out along the coast. So in inland areas, they're really common in the winter time though. And so we get migratory birds from elsewhere that come 
and form these big flocks. And a lot of times they're mixed in with golden crown sparrows. And golden crown sparrows are here from, I think it's September to May. They spend a fair amount of time here, but they don't actually breed here. But they have a very distinct song that's sort of a three part. It's like a D, D, D. Um, and so you might hear that, especially right now, because they're, they're just starting to take off and typically they start singing before they take off. And then another common voice that you might hear around your neighborhood um, are red-shouldered hawks, and they are super vocal. And so especially in California, we have a distinct, we have a, a distinct population of red-shouldered hawks that's separate from the other red-shouldered hawks in the country, like on the East Coast. And here in California, we have really brightly colored birds, and then also um, they're super vocal. So the adults and the juveniles can be vocalizing, you know, pretty much any time of year. And so they, um, they're frequently found in urban areas. They're perch hunters. So you can see them on, on telephone lines and telephone poles, and they kind of have this very um, kind of characteristic posture where, where they're kind of upright and they're looking down over field or um, the side of a road or something like that. Um, but then, like I said, you can listen for that care, 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 care. It's this repeated sound and they're quite vocal. White-tailed kites will also uh, nest in neighborhoods. And a lot of times you can find them, they nest at the very tops of trees and these are gorgeous birds. They're, they're very pale in color, especially their underside. They do what's called hover hunting where they um, kind of hang in the air and they flap their wings while they're looking down and they're looking for prey. And these uh, birds specialize in voles, which is a small rodent. And voles are really abundant all year round. And so these birds really specialize in that. They're known to be able to see in the ultraviolet um, spectrum and, and vol urine actually reflects in the ultraviolet spectrum. So they're getting this UV reflection that the birds can detect and, and um, voles tend to travel above ground, but through grassland areas, they kind of make little tunnels in the grasses. And so these birds can actually look down and if they see a concentration of vol urine, then there's a pretty good chance a vol is going to come back that way again. Um, so these are beautiful birds and they build their nests kind of in at the tops of trees. So sometimes they're fairly exposed that we're able to see them. Um, and when the young fledge, they, they, their begging vocalization is this really harsh, just um, really noticeable sound, which I always think, um, you know, probably encourages the, the adults to put food in their mouths and make it stop. And then we also have great horned owls around our neighborhoods. Um, and one thing to keep an eye for is sometimes Crows, well, as I said earlier, great horned owls are, are kind of the greatest predatory threat to crows. And um, so a lot of times during the day, if, a, if an owl is hanging out in a tree, and they'll do this for any type of owl, but um, you'll see crows swooping down on a tree and just calling and vocalizing and a lot of other birds will chime in. So you get what's called this mobbing behavior. Um, they'll also do it to raptors like uh, hawks and things like that. But it can be a kind of a good way to find an owl. So if, if all of a sudden, you know, if you're inside and outside, you suddenly hear this cacophony of noise, get out and take a look because you might find a, a, an interesting bird that's the subject of that mobbing. Um, and great horn owls, you can hear during the nighttime. A lot of times they, their voices kind of echo through our neighborhoods and males are smaller than the females, but they have a larger voice box and that results in a deeper voice. And these will, um, during courtship, they'll actually duet. And so you can have a male and female calling back and forth to each other or kind of on top of each other. Um, and you can pick out the higher voice is the female and the lower voice is the male. We also have screech owls uh, around urban settings. Screech owls are one of the most common owls, but you hardly ever get to see them. They're so well camouflaged. So. Um, they're cavity nesters, and as you can see, they blend in incredibly well with bark, and they're, they're really small birds. And they really only vocalize typically like December through February, so during courtship. And they'll vocalize in the middle of the night, and it sort of sounds like this bouncing ball. It's like a whoop, 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 whoop. So you can listen for that um, during those months, December through February. And one good way to actually see them is to put up an owl box. And so um, there are places where you can get owl boxes and get information about, you know, whether or not your yard is a good spot. 
But again, because um, cavities are, are sort of at a minimum in some areas, the screech owls really can readily take to these boxes. So that's something to think about. But another thing to think about is if you put up an owl box, you really want to make sure that nobody in your neighborhood is putting out rat poisoning. And so just, just think about that. Um, you know, whenever you're putting up anything like a, a bird feeder or a bird bath or a box or anything like that, um, the last thing you want is to encourage the animals to come into an unsafe environment. So just think about what's going on in your area before you put up anything like that. And then barn owls um, are also birds that can be observed in neighborhoods and they hunt in the dead of night. They have amazing vision and hearing. They are able to um, locate prey in almost virtual darkness. And their faces have a very different shape from our other owls. They're taxonomically in a different group. So they have this heart-shaped face, but all of those little feathers that are uh, radiating around the eyes of owls are directing the sound to their ears. So they have incredible hunting, which, or, sorry, incredible hearing, which helps them hunt in the evening. Um, and barn owls do this, this really interesting vocalization that sort of people describe it as, it sounds like a metal rake on concrete. It's this shriek. And typically that's a male who has been out hunting and is returning to the nest with food. And so that shriek usually is announcing that he's coming back to the nest. And so these guys are also cavity nesters. Um, they also make this like clicking sound, which is really interesting, but, um, Palm trees can be a good place to see them. So if you're if you're out and about in your neighborhoods, walking around your neighborhoods and there are palm trees, um, take a second look because you might find Orioles nesting in them, although they typically use different types of palms. Um, and then sometimes you can see these guys as well. So um, no matter where you live, what, what the area is like, um, what time of year it is, what time of day it is, there's almost always an opportunity to get to know your feathered neighbors better. So keep your, keep your eyes open and your, and your ears open. All right, and with that, uh, if Shireen is still, yeah, there you are. Hi, um, thank you so much, um, Shannon. So much information here, lots of questions. So I'm gonna dive right into the chat and hopefully we'll get through them in the next 10 minutes. And um, I also wanted to mention that I put the county website in the chat so um, for the county park. So um, you can find that easily. So the first question is, do birds get drunk from eating toy on berries? Yeah, so um, yes. So sometimes when, when berries are still on bushes and they become overripe, they start to ferment. And so this can be different types of berries. It can be things like toyons or pyrocantha or even blackberries. Um, and so they can become intoxicated. And in some cases, it actually can be if they if birds are eating too much, it can actually be toxic to them. But yes, they can get a little tipsy. Okay. What size is the hooded Oriole? It is sort of, um, it's smaller than a than a scrub jay and more slender, but it has a long tail. Um, oh, what would it be comparable to? If anybody's familiar with a mockingbird, I would say it's a, about that size, maybe a little bit smaller. Thank you. Is it healthy for the birds to eat the sugar from the hummingbird feeders? Is it too much sugar? No, the birds seemingly, if the, that the birds that are able to process those sugars are, it's great for them. They do just fine. One thing I should say is, and hopefully people are aware of this at this point, in the past, um, people would put red food coloring. You don't need to do that. You just, just the regular, just typically what you want to do is four parts water and one part sugar. And just don't use honey. Definitely don't use honey. Don't use brown sugar. Just use regular white sugar. The Audubon Society has a good recipe for hummingbird food. Um, so just as a thought. Um, Someone asks, is our saline swimming pool a good watering hole for birds? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Quick. What does it mean if a woodpecker pecks on my house? So it could be, well, they peck for different reasons. One, it might be that, um, that the house gives off a really good sound. 
And so during the breeding season, they're drumming uh, to advertise their territory. It's kind of like other birds, like songbirds singing. So it could just be that they're making a lot of noise. Um, they could be trying to excavate a hole. You know, I don't know what the house is built up. Um, and also they frequently, you know, on, um, on trees and stuff, they're, they're looking for insects. And so they're using that bill to create holes to get to things like beetle grubs and things like that. So um, it's hard to say what's going on with the house, but I've seen woodpeckers do that as well. Thank you. Um, two questions about um, titmice. Is the oak titmouse the only titmouse species in the area? And what distinguishes bush tits from titmice? Okay, yeah. So the oak titmouse is the only titmouse that's found here um, in Marin and the adjoining areas. Um, and one thing to look for on the titmouse is that it has a little crest. And sometimes I've noticed, especially on hot days, they'll kind of lower that so it's not as obvious. But typically it's got this nice little crest. Um, the bush tits are smaller and they've got a longer tail. So, so tit mice are kind of these, they're kind of like small stocky birds. And then bush tits are smaller, um, like a little puff with a long tail. And they're super agile. So bush tits frequently will travel in flocks. And so they have, they raise a lot of young during the breeding season. And then those family groups end up in the wintertime joining other family groups. And so where there's one bush tit, a lot of times there are other bush tits. At the beginning of the breeding season, you will just have, you know, typically a pair. Sometimes they can have other adults that are helping out. Um, but anyway, so a lot of times you get multiple bush tits and they're constantly vocalizing. This very high pitched chatter is going on. Um, whereas the tit mice, um, usually you have a pair and their voices are very different. So one thing is to listen to is a little bit of a, a harsher voice in the tit mice. Thank you. Um, someone comments, I've seen crows dive bombing hawks and ravens in our neighborhood. And Definitely. then we have a question, is there a good website or app for hearing bird songs? Um, yeah, so a couple things. There's a, there's a, uh, Cornell University is a wonderful resource for um, their ornithology um, website. Well, they have two. So they've got one that's a subscription, which is um, Birds of the World, but there's a free one called All About Birds and it's through Cornell University. And it has great photos, it has vocalizations, um, and it has great information. So that's a really great source. And then they have also um, partnered on this app called Merlin, and it's a free app. Um, so you can just go to your app store and get it. And so make sure if you, if you do this, make sure that you get, it's called Merlin by Cornell Ornithology or Cornell University or something. Merlin by Ordell, Bird ID, Merlin Bird ID by Cornell. I think that's what it's called. Anyway, it's free. Um, and I have used it sort of minimally, but it seems to be really good at accurately identifying birds. So you can actually, um, when you're in the field, you can play, there's a thing called sound ID. And so it'll tell you what it's hearing. It'll also make a recording of that. And so you can listen to it later, which can be helpful. If there's more than one bird vocalizing at the same time, it will show you all of those birds. Um, so that's a fun app and it seems to be usually quite accurate. One thing to keep in mind is sometimes it will sort of make a suggestion. So let's say um, it might say indigo bunting and lazuli bunting. And there's a much greater chance that here in this area, it's a lazuli bunting, right? So then there's something uh, that says, um, you can click, yes, this is my bird after you look at more information or whatever. Um, anyway, so it's not 100% accurate, but it's a really great tool. If you're inside and you've got your windows open and you don't know who's you know, singing outside, it can be a great way to find out. Or if you're learning bird song, you know, to go out in the field and listen, try to identify it yourself, and then you can double check with the app, something like that, so. Great information, thank you for that. Speaking of Merlins, someone asks, how common are Merlins? 
So Merlins are here in the wintertime. And so they breed way up north, like up in the Arctic. Um, but in the wintertime, they follow migratory songbirds, which is one of their main prey items. And so when the songbirds come down, so do the Merlins. And so we get a fair number of them in the wintertime. Um, they are, you know, uh, regularly sighted here, but they're not super abundant. Thank you. Um, so we've got some nice thank yous, excellent and super informative presentation. I couldn't agree more. Um, and then we have a few questions about the video recording of this and other talks by Shannon. So you can find them on our website, which is www.marinlibrary.org. It's a little bit more challenging, honestly, but you can search the site. Um, what I recommend is going to YouTube and typing in Marin County Free Library, you'll bring up the um, YouTube channel for the Marin County Free Library. And there you'll see all the videos and you can search or just scan among them and you'll see some, all of Shannon's talks that we've done together and that have been recorded successfully as well as a variety of other talks. And if you have any questions about that, I'll put my um, email in the chat and you can contact me directly and I'll send you the links. So back to birds, um, which of these birds can be found at Stinson Beach? You know, I actually don't spend a lot of time at Stinson Beach, so I'm not, I, I can't really picture what the surrounding habitat is, unfortunately, sorry. Okay, so a good project for someone. <laughs> Walk around Stinson Beach, have a good time, take your bird book and your Cornell app and see what you find. Um, so next question. Oh, I think that's it. I think we are at the very informative and beautiful presentation. Thank you. Fabulous bird pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a comment here that says, oh, here's a question. Um, so someone asked for the app for the bird songs and that was um, the Merlin app by Cornell. And then how often um, does the Rufus hummingbird show up here? Um, I'll get to the Rufus in one second. I forgot to mention also uh, there's something called the Macaulay Library, which you kind of have to weed through. But if you're, if you're trying to learn bird vocalizations, keep that one in mind too. Um, it has tons and tons of recording and it actually shows the like graph, um, the little sonograms. So that can, that can be interesting too. Um, Rufus hummingbirds do come through, so they don't breed here. They look very similar to um, the Allen's hummingbird. Typically they have more orange on them and the Allen's has a little bit more green. Um, but so they move through on migration. So in both like in the um, early spring and then in the fall, you can get them and they move through. <laughs> 